Hi guys, it's me P and welcome back to Girl on Girl. If you're new here, hi, my name is Persis. I go by P and I am a Indian Canadian lesbian. I actually only started getting comfortable with the word lesbian like maybe just a couple years ago. I had first initially come out as bisexual when I was, well, I should say publicly came out as bisexual when I was 23, I believe, but I knew I was into women for as long as I can remember, probably since I was a teenager. I am taking over this podcast and I'm going to be doing solo episodes because if you're a returning subscriber, you'll notice that I used to host these episodes with my best friend and that's where the premise of Girl on Girl even started. For anyone new here, um, it's just going to be me, but you can listen back to old episodes just to get an idea of what Girl on Girl is really about. Those old episodes were taking my perspective as a gay woman and having my co-host perspective as a straight woman. That was coming together for us to have these like beautiful, candid conversations about sexuality. And we were learning so much and would at times invite other people in on the conversation to learn about their queer stories and as well and also their coming out journeys. Really happy you're here. Thank you for coming to listen to this. This is my first time really taking on the podcast on my own and having co like solo conversations. So I am a, I am nervous, but I also think this will be a really good chance for me to continue using my voice and also just getting more vulnerable with all of you because I feel that is so important. Like I cannot even stress this enough. When I was growing up, I was always on YouTube, always trying to listen to any form of media where I felt I could see myself being represented because it's very rare, especially being a person of color and being gay. I wanted to use my voice and hope that this would at least reach one person. If it does, amazing. That makes me really happy. This is going to be a very like casual setup as I'm still trying to figure out how the podcast structure is going to be, as you can tell. I guess I can start with what's been going on, how the week has been. This week has been very busy, actually, just for starters. My girlfriend, Crystal, and I have actually just been getting up to a lot, just trying to declutter our lives, basically. We're getting rid of a bunch of stuff and trying to become more minimal. But in more um, fun news, we went to the Janet Jackson concert just last night. So by the time I post this, the concert would have been on the Wednesday. But we went and it was so much fun, just so much nostalgia in one room. And this was my first time seeing Janet live. And I have to say, she is an incredible performer. I would always watch Janet performances on TV, on YouTube. She is so iconic, but to see her live was such an incredible feeling. She really knows how to put on a show. And actually, I was talking to one of my best friends, Kyle, about Janet's performance because he was at the same concert. And Kyle and I are huge, huge Britney Spears fans. I have loved Britney since I was a kid, and that love just like literally has never stopped. I think she is just so incredible and such an influential artist. And as I was watching Janet's performance, I was like, I can totally see where Britney took inspiration from Janet because as such a Britney fan, I've seen her four times um, or no, I've seen her three times live. I've seen her at her circus tour. I saw her in Vegas and I saw her for Femme Fatale when I was uh, much younger. I was in high school when I saw that tour. I could really see the similarities, especially um, when I was looking back at some Onyx Hotel tours that Britney did for In the Zone. I was like, wow, I, I can see like where that inspiration was. And Kyle totally worded it perfectly. He's like, it's mother and daughter. And that's so true. I love going to shows. I love my pop divas. And I can really appreciate like a really good production and good choreography. Crystal and I were loving it. It was so much fun. She um, had actually surprised me with the ticket. So I didn't like expect to be going at all um, until a couple of days before. So that was a really sweet surprise. Oh, I guess I should also mention it was Pride Weekend in Toronto. That was really, really fun. We got up to a lot in the city and try to just hang around Church Street. If uh, you're not from Toronto, Church Street is basically like the gay village. So there's a lot of gay bars. There's um, like drag shows you can watch. It's a really fun time. And that's probably where we spent like a majority 
of our time was out on Church Street. And then we went to a um, queer pool party at night on the Friday night. That was so much fun as well. Such good music. The venue was so large. So that's basically how my week was. Um, I hope you guys have been having a really good week as well. So I actually wanted to dive straight into this podcast topic because this was actually a conversation Crystal and I were talking about just a couple of days ago. And I was like, this might be really good to talk about on the podcast because I'd be really curious to hear what other people have to think and say about this. It's about how to really nurture and create a really long lasting, loving, romantic relationship. The reason why I thought about this is because I was hearing a lot of people talk about the honeymoon stage or when the honeymoon stage eventually fizzles out. You know, you you miss the early days of your relationship. I am not an expert. All of my opinions here are going to be more subjective and I'm going to be relating it to my own dating experiences and also to my relationship. But I guess as I really thought about what the honeymoon stage even meant, I was wondering if we should debunk this. Like, what is the honeymoon stage even? And how do we change up this narrative? Or how can we make this so-called honeymoon stage last even longer in our relationships? I understand when you first start dating someone new, for example, and there's so many butterflies, there's nervousness, it's kind of the unexpected that it can cause this feeling in your body to not know what the next step is going to be, which I think can be causing that excitement. When you're in the first couple months of dating, I think they always say the the honeymoon stage, I think is like at the first three month mark, or I think it it can go up to six months, or maybe even a year where everything is just bliss in the relationship. As much as I can say, I can see why that is because it's so new. I was talking about this with Crystal and thinking, how can we, or how can your long-term relationship still be in that phase of that exciting phase? And what are some tips on like how we can get there? So it's not, you know, you're hearing conversations of people saying, oh, I really miss like the early days of my relationship. And to me, I always just want to know, well, why is that so common? Why is that narrative being told all the time? I even remember a conversation I had with my friend, and this was when I was three months into dating Crystal. And my friend who had been, who has been in a very long-term relationship was basically saying, oh, I really miss like those early days, like those early days of that excitement. And um, it's so new. Do we even like that phrase, the honeymoon phase? That's something else I'm trying to wrap my head around is what does the honeymoon phase even mean? Where did it come from? And why do I feel like so many people say they they were in a relationship and they were in the honeymoon phase. And once that honeymoon phase is over, it's like all of these problems start creeping in and like life's realities and people just miss the early days. But in in my mind, sometimes I'm like, is that even real? I don't know. Maybe I'm not making any sense right now, but we're going to we're going to get into it. So just like the actual definition for everyone of the honeymoon phase, and this is just on Google, it's saying the honeymoon phase is a blissful, carefree period in a couple's relationship. Both partners are just getting to know each other and seem to find little fault with their significant other. Everything that new partner does from how they eat to the stories they tell feels charming and endearing. And this typically lasts between a few months to two years. Some couples spend a lot of time in the honeymoon phase. Others move past it pretty quickly. So it's very different for everybody. And I understand that in the beginning of a relationship, of course, there's like so much excitement. There's so many sparks. It's something new. I think anytime there's newness that's exciting for anybody, whether it's a new move, it's a new job, it's a, it's new friends, anything new is going to be so exciting. Because I find as I've been hearing different stories or even some things like people I know have said, they probably don't even mean it in a bad way, but there are little parts of them that kind of seem to resent their partner after it's been so many years and maybe there's little things that happened and how you deal with conflict and all that all of that's inevitable nobody's going to be staying in this like blissful type of relationship forever that's just not realistic but how can you work on your communication styles with your partner to ensure that you're on the same team always and there doesn't have to be resent so i know i just said a bunch but as crystal and i were talking about this 
I wanted to kind of talk about this on the podcast and get really vulnerable with with all of you as well that I feel sometimes even like the the beginning of a relationship can actually be very tough. And I don't know if a lot of people really talk about this. Actually, even in mine and Crystal's first year of dating, now we've been together for about a year and a half. But I want to say actually in the first few months of our relationship was a lot of discovery. It was a lot more conflict and a lot more like hurdles we had to get through to get to a place of feeling like very secure and good with our relationship. And this is just me being totally candid. I find obviously everything in the beginning is so new and so exciting, but you know, you're also, when you're dating someone and it's new, it's a new personality and it's someone new you're inviting into your life and you're becoming very vulnerable with and you're sharing everything with. As we've been dating even longer, we're getting so much more stronger that I find it's interesting when I feel couples say, um, oh, I miss like the early days. Whereas for me, I kind of feel like when life creeps in and you really start to see the realities of your person, like your human, you're dating, and they're not putting up a front. They're not trying to show you the best version of themselves. They're just getting deep with you and showing you basically everything. I find that like so much more fulfilling and also like very attractive. I've always been a very open book, even when I was a kid or even starting my YouTube channel and I'm starting to post videos on it again, but also while doing the podcast, talking about my sexuality, I've always been very emotional, very open and very forward. And I really am receptive to people who are that same way with me. The more vulnerable you are in the beginning, I find it actually a lot more endearing. Crystal and I kind of got that way fairly quickly. I, I know that's not how everybody operates, but I think us doing that definitely got us very, very close. And there was a lot of trust built throughout that period as well. When it comes to like nurturing your relationship, trust is very, very key. That also comes over time. I don't think you can just say you trust someone. I think they do need to, you need to show them that they can trust you. And once that trust is there, you'll find yourself in a completely, like if anything, even better stage in your relationship than maybe you were in like the first couple months. Yeah, maybe they call it the honeymoon phase because it's a honeymoon is always kind of meant to end. Like even when newlyweds go away after their wedding, they're not on a, a lifetime honeymoon. You know what I mean? They're away for vacation and then they come back. So I guess that is kind of what where that term is even coming from. I was always so curious about the people who've been in longer relationships and they're feeling like it's very mundane because life just kind of gets in the way. I think relationships take a lot of work. It's like nurturing a plant. <laughs> I'm not going to be trying to do analogies right now because I'm I would be I'm horrible at them. But having a relationship is like taking care of something. It's about being nurturing to, to another human and that is vice versa. I uh, saw a clip on TikTok that I thought was really cool. It was a Jimmy Fallon interview, actually. It was like a compilation of him asking all of these couples who have been in long relationships, like, what is the trick? What do you do? And something that Jessica Alba said actually really, really resonated with me, and I thought it was really important to say, was always make sure your partner is a priority. I know people are going to listen to that and be like, well, duh. Yeah, of course. But I don't think we realize when life is happening, right? We have so many things on the go. We have work. We have our friendships. We have family. We have our pets. We have our extracurriculars, our sports, our hobbies, all these things, right? Y yes, your partner is listed in there, but where where do they fall in on like, I'm going to nurture my relationship and put my partner as a priority? I found what she said was just so true. She said, always ensure that your partner is a priority and the moment they start to not be a priority in your life is I think when it's done. And I was like, yeah, it's it's hard to hear that kind of stuff. I feel like it um it's uncomfortable, but I also I completely agree with it. Your part and I don't want people to hear this and think I'm saying your partner is your only priority. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying I think it's really important for them to be a priority. And I think more often than not, I don't think people do this on purpose, but as life just goes on and we have so much stuff being thrown our way, 
you might find yourself like not prioritizing your partner anymore. Sarah and I actually talked about this on our last episode. If you guys want to listen to the last one, I had Sarah on to talk about why she wasn't going to be doing Girl on Girl with me weekly anymore. A lot of it actually was because of the burnout both her and I were feeling from our jobs and just like regular life duties. And one thing Sarah actually mentioned that I didn't even take into account was that her and I actually at that time both got into new relationships. And something Sarah mentioned was that we at those moments were really prioritizing our partnerships, which is very important. We would be, you know, not all the time, but at times making decisions to say, you know, instead of doing this late night recording because of the time difference, I would like to spend time with my partner during this time, you know, because especially when the day gets really busy, we're all working and you didn't get to have that quality time. I'm going to make that decision to do it. And that's really important. And we both understood each other through that. For Crystal and I, um, because we live together, of course, we spend a lot of our time in the evenings together. But during the day, we're we're both busy. We both have work. And sometimes just throughout the week, what with so many like social obligations as well between both her and I, we we always have to ensure we need to have date night. We need we need to make sure we're having some quality time. And that means making dinner together, spending time with our cats together, watching our favorite movie or show, just watching a new movie or show. We're we're big fans of any like true crime documentaries or any thrillers. Most of my friends know that that is like one of my favorite genres. Crystal is a big fan too. So those are ways we really try to make time together, but also to go to events together, go to concerts, like do those things that are like, we are still having date night. People say this all the time. Make sure you are prioritizing date night. And it doesn't have to be anything extravagant, just even sometimes going to your favorite restaurant, sharing an appetizer, getting a couple drinks, whatever you want. It's those really sweet romantic times and it can, and no phones, you know, I think another thing too is obviously we all have our phones on us, but when we're eating dinner together, make sure you're not distracted on social media, put it away and just have good chats. Talk about your day, talk about things that are bothering you right now, things that are exciting you right now. I find that's really important. My love languages are for sure physical touch and quality time. And I think I've been noticing a lot when life gets busy, that one-on-one quality time is just so, so good. And it should never be forgotten. Always, always prioritize it for sure. To get closer to your partner, I believe, is to actually have the tough conversations. As you, you're not afraid of conflict or you just really speak about what's on your mind, the more you do that, the more your partner, or at least once again, this is my subjective experience, but I feel like when I would open up to Crystal about things that were bothering me or things that were on my mind, it would just make us that much closer because you're not building resentment. And I think for a lot of couples, I think the more you hold things in or you're not telling them how you feel over the years, that builds resentment that you don't even know was building up. And I think when it gets to that point, if like there's so much resentment and you didn't express how you were feeling, I just, I don't think that's very fair to the other person. And we can all be guilty of it, right? But as I've learned through this relationship and my communication style as well, I should not be holding things in. That's not good for me. It's not good for Crystal. I need to just let her know how I feel and we can talk things through. And it's the same vice versa. I've even told Crystal, if there's anything on your mind, just tell me. Like I would rather you just be open and honest with me than you hold it in and then later down the road, there's just resentment there or something I do like reminds you of that and then it ticks you off. You know what I mean? I just think that can cause so many issues down the road. So this is never, then you're never going to have the perfect relationship. It's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. I just think how can we continue to have long lasting, loving relationships? Relationships where you're literally like, my partner is my bestie, you know, we're best friends and we just got each other and we are doing life together. I'm speaking from a monogamous perspective, of course, this is what I'm saying. Like, this is just all my experiences. But I think once you can get to that level 
of a strong relationship with someone, it's a really, really beautiful thing. It's not only like communication is key, but it's also learning your communication styles. And I guess to get a little more specific with that is that it was really eye-opening and really good for both of us because I think throughout that time, I discovered a lot about myself and so did Crystal. And we also had to unlearn a lot of things. Like even for me, it was unlearning some of my ways of being of like how my anxieties would sometimes really take over. And I didn't even know I like had that in me really um, until I started, you know, seeing Crystal seriously and certain things I had experienced in my past, past, I was projecting onto Crystal. And she later told me that she was doing that as well. And we both would just sit down and talk about it so openly and be like, well, how can we best support each other in these scenarios? Like, what can I do to help you? And what can these are, this is what you can do to help me because this is what I'm receptive to. And I think in terms of your communication fighting style, I actually think I heard um, Cammie and Taryn talk about this on one podcast episode. Shout out to Staying Up Podcast. I love that podcast so much. One of my tactics was that I would ruminate a lot. So sometimes in a conflict with Crystal, I would go on and on and on about it. And I couldn't really let something go. And it, it, just in the sense of like, if I would feel like there was still some uneasiness or tension in the air, I would want to fix it right away. I was like, no, we need to talk about this like for hours, which now <laughs> me in my relationship now, I don't do that anymore. And I've actually noticed the difference. And I told Crystal that I was like, I feel last year when we would have some kind of conflict, I remember we would go on, on in circles about it, just going over every single detail, talking about multiple different scenarios, all these things. And she's like, she she said, yeah, I know. I, I remember those moments too. And she's a little bit more blunt than me. She will kind of like say something. I'll hold on to it. I'll be like, I heard what you said and that that's something I'm going to remember. But then she'll be quick to like move on fairly quickly in the sense like she can go about her day. And I remember, let's say her and I had like a, a conflict or an argument. Crystal would be like, we, we solved that. We figured that out. And I, and I would say yes. But then in the back of my mind, I was still kind of like not over it because I would then see Crystal go up to our cat Besso, for example, and start cuddling him or tickling him. And, and I laugh now because I'm like, oh my God, this is so silly. But I would watch her doing that almost like she was over the situation or over the fight. Yet I'm sitting there being like, how is she over it that quickly? Like, I am still sitting here, like, upset. We This would be a whole other episode, but maybe that's more of, like, a based on just our personalities, yes. But also, I always make a joke that I'm a Scorpio moon, so I feel my emotions very, very deep. And sometimes, like, a little intensely. And Scorpio is my Mars, too, so that's how I deal with anger. If anyone's curious, I'm a Libra sun, Scorpio moon, Capricorn rising. So I find the Capricorn really balances out my Scorpio moon by kind of helping me be a little bit more grounded. And my Libra sun is the very social side of me, the more very friendly person who's very easygoing. So some people are really surprised when I say I'm a Scorpio moon. They're like, no way, what? Actually, my friend Jess mentioned that in a group chat we had with some friends. She's like, you do not strike me as a Scorpio moon. The interesting thing about that is that because our moons are our internal emotions, I don't think I would be showing a lot of people my Scorpio moon because that's my own internal stuff. I think Crystal can see it because she's seeing, you know, all my emotions all the time, which I think happens, of course, when you're living with a partner. To look back at where we were a year ago as to where we are now is, is only getting stronger. And I can genuinely say that. And it makes me so happy. And I think learning about another person is such an incredible thing. It helps us also become stronger ourselves if we can learn about our partners and kind of pick up on their traits that we find like really admirable. And even in conversations I've had with Crystal, because she's been very blunt in the past, she would come to me later in a time of conflict when we'd resolve something and she'd be like, being with you has also made me softer. And I tell Crystal, being with her has made me a little bit more tough. I, I've always been a little bit more of like you're easygoing, a very uh, not, uh, no, I guess I can say it. I think passive because I think in a lot of ways I would 
let things slide or I would let things go when really deep down I was feeling like upset about something. But I think being with someone who's kind of the opposite, who's kind of like a no BS, I'm going to call it like it is, has helped me get to that part of myself where I stand up for myself a lot more. It's not to say that my personality, and I wouldn't want it to change. I'm not saying that. Being with someone who helps me see those things actually really helps. Like it opens up your your mindset a little bit more. That's going to be a whole other episode is me talking about some of my people-pleasing tendencies and how I had to let that go over the years. And I call myself a recovering people pleaser because I definitely am. I've never been someone who's fearful of conflict, actually, which people might find surprising. And maybe that's because I like to talk things out. I'm, I'm very much like a let's communicate, let's talk. It has its benefits, but also the faults of that can be if you're overdoing it. And I feel like I was doing that last year quite a bit. Overall, I find, just to sum this episode up, because I, I do feel like it kind of uh, touched upon a few different topics, but I think we should maybe let go of this idea of our relationships are only exciting in the beginning. Therefore, it's the honeymoon phase. And then once you're past the honeymoon phase, there's no more sparks. There's no more fireworks. Now we're just in reality. It's just life. We don't need to call it the honeymoon phase. But how about we turn it into something where we're we're continuing our relationships on our journey with our partner or our partners. We're finding out things that just make it more beautiful each year we're together. I'm excited to just continue doing life with Crystal and I'm excited for us to grow. That's another thing is like growing with your person is is very very important otherwise you'll you'll just be stuck. You'll be stuck in your old ways, you're not learning anything. I want to continue to nurture my relationship. I'm excited to be in that phase where where we can actually even look back maybe and be like, "Oh my gosh, the first year of relationship was like as beautiful as as it was." look at how much we learned since then rather than like I'm so remi- reminiscent on our on our first year you know what I mean or the first few months like I'm so reminiscent on those times like if anything I can confidently say that I'm the happiest I've been in my in my relationship at this phase of life and you know what we've been together for a year and a half so I know a lot of you are saying like oh you guys are still so early on it's the first year of your relationship but I, I will get into this a little bit more as podcast episodes keep rolling out but my relationship with crystal actually happened quite fast the way our relationship progressed was maybe faster than what your typical like first few months of a relationship would be if that makes sense i always kind of make the joke we were classic u-haul lesbians but really we we didn't even plan to move in together that quickly it just happened because we we just loved spending time together so much and from there on we were learning so much about each other and then she eventually did officially move in with me when you move in with a partner you're learning about everything so quickly you know you're not just seeing each other a couple times a week three times a week maybe to go on like dates you're you're really spending like a lot of time right So I think in ways we learned a lot about each other fast, but it was really, really beneficial. And it it made me realize she's someone I really, really want to be with and spend my time with. And um, it's made me really grateful too to have found someone like that. There's going to be more podcast episodes coming down the road where I'll have Crystal on and we'll talk about our relationship and how that even started. And I'd be so curious to hear everyone's thoughts because once again, This is coming from a subjective perspective. Like I'm definitely not an expert or like have the um, credentials to be speaking about this like facts. Once again, this is all from personal experience. What do you guys think of the term like honeymoon phase or what does it mean for you when it ends? And how can we maybe get back to that point of where we're consistently in something like the honeymoon phase? And I don't mean like the make-believe bliss where your partner has no faults because that's just simply not true. And I'm not trying to say that's how your relationship should be. It should never. But what are some steps we can do to to continue to nurture our relationships? Please let me know what you think. Um, I'd be happy to jump in some DMs with anyone and we can have like a really open discussion about this or if there's anything that I missed. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast episode. I really miss doing this. Honestly, I do. And I think as time goes on, I'll probably feel more comfortable in like just speaking on a topic by myself because full transparency, I I was even telling Sarah this, it's going to be so weird for me to just come on and continue the podcast 
without Sarah having that banter so we can have some open conversations. This is such a good challenge for me and it's something I really missed. I miss the community. I miss talking to you guys, being super active in it. going to go back to a Monday cadence and it's going to be weekly. I'm going to be throwing in some questions on my Instagram story or um, if you guys have any questions for me. Thank you again for listening. If you want to follow the podcast, you can find us on Instagram at girlxgirlpodcast and on TikTok. And you can listen to us anywhere you find podcasts. I will be seeing you guys next Monday.